It's paintbrushes at dawn, the fight over some of Hungary's grandest galleries. This week, we find out how left and right have drawn, or rather painted, battle lines over the cultural soul of Budapest. We head for Taiwan to hear why a decades-old military standoff is giving inspiration to tourists. And... The shores of Oman, the streets of Nagoya, and the trails of Val d'Isere. That's coming up on Insider Guide. Foster, welcome to Fast Track. 30 minutes of travel news and temptation for your next trip. Now, most of us, when we visit the old cities of Europe, we tend to make a beeline straight for the grander buildings, and Budapest is no exception, with its stunning array of museums, galleries, and theatres. But is the line between the corridors of culture and the corridors of power becoming blurred? Keith Wallace has been to Hungary to find out why there's trouble at the turnstiles. Rapunzel might have stood on one of these fairy tale balconies and let her hair down. Budapest's castle district feels like that kind of place. It's all heritage and high culture, and that's what the swarms of tourists have come here to photograph. But that Hungarian culture is becoming a battleground, as left and right jostle for the keys to the soul of the capital. Take theatre, for instance. Robert Alfaldi is now a judge on Hungary's version of the X Factor talent show, but until June he was creative director of the National Theatre. His term came to an end and he was replaced. His opponents say the sexual nature of some of his plays was just too much for an upstanding cultural institution. His supporters claim the decision was a political one. They say he was forced out by the right-wing authorities for being too liberal. Alfaldi himself says language used about him by some politicians in Parliament was shocking. <laughs> They said traitor. They said anti-Christian. They said that I turned the National Theatre into a brothel. They said that I falsified the works of art. They said that I ruined the moral sense of the children. Of course, these concerns ripple beyond theatre. There have been changes and controversies too at some of the country's key institutions, some of the main museums and art galleries, including here at the flagship modern art museum, Mucharnok. <laughs> This exhibition called What is Hungarian prompted a rebuke from the head of Hungary's state-subsidised Academy of Arts. He called it national blasphemy, promising that cultural institutions should no longer, as he put it, deviate from an attitude of national identification. Shortly afterwards, Muchanok's director resigned, citing concern over the Academy's future influence over his gallery. All across the city, there have been similar cries of interference and high-profile staffing changes. For instance, in January last year, Budapest's mayor picked an actor known for his far-right views to be director of the prominent new theatre, sparking left-wing protests outside. Staffing changes at the Trafford Centre for Contemporary Art have prompted cries of political interference, and this summer saw a sit-in at the Ludwig Art Gallery by protesters who claimed the selection process for a new director there was opaque and, once again, politically motivated. You're seeing kind of top-down changes that are coming directly from the government. Those would be uh, changes at the head of institutions from people who were really respected cultural leaders to people who are clearly government, government operatives doing what the government wants. You're seeing the same with money. The money is being taken away from good cultural programs and being given to blatantly uh, people who blatantly support the government with their message. 
This feeds into wider concerns about authoritarianism in the Hungarian government. The European Union, the US and human rights groups have all criticised proposed amendments to the constitution as anti-democratic. Planned reforms to the media and judiciary were scrapped after the European Commission threatened legal action. As far as the culture goes, foreign and domestic artists, theatre critics and academics have all written to the government in protest. However, it says it has nothing to do with artistic decisions. They were made by the Academy of Arts or the mayor. Look, I, we don't have a position on, on, on this. It's, 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 simply, it's simply not our, not our, uh, our job to, to make these kinds of decisions. Uh, you know, uh, of course, there could be performances, there could be uh, products which are uh, disturbing for certain kinds of audiences. Art is there to, to, to disturb you sometimes, and uh, we know that. And art is there to, to generate discussions. Uh, and discussions are generated, but this is, this is how it should be in an open society, I guess. Has the government ever applied any pressure when it comes to things like staffing decisions? Well, I, I don't know. You know I cannot, cannot really recall any kind of uh, uh, example for, for that. I know that there are accusations, but you know, if you, if you put together all the developments and if you look at the big picture, I guess the direction is absolutely fine. We have a flourishing cultural life. A new Roma restaurant caters to visitors to the 9th district, a run-down part of town which is also not far from Budapest's popular ruined pubs, charismatic and crowded most nights of the week. Rock festivals are a key feature here on the cultural calendar and thousands attended the Gay Pride Parade here in June, albeit to the soundtrack of far-right protests. So it might be too much to say that alternative culture here is dying. Take Musi, an artist's collective that's taken root in an old Soviet shopping centre. The organisers say they were forced here when the city council took back from them a series of downtown buildings where they'd painted, drawn, rehearsed and met. The city has closed these places all in, this, in two or three months. So lots of... Uh, uh, companies, this community uh, just had no place at all. They tried to uh, centralize the culture, what is mean the more popular and more Hungarian culture is more uh, important than the independent culture. There is a right-wing war on culture, the, the left-wing leaders are getting kicked out, the left-wing thinkers are getting pushed out in favor of people with a nationalist kind of uniform message. Um, the diversity is also suffering because of this. It's not just one, one political mindset replacing another. It's a political mindset replacing free thinkers. But that relationship between the government and artists is something that's been exercising minds across Europe. Only this month, a British playwright told the Edinburgh TV Festival how lots of state subsidy can sometimes lead to too cosy a relationship, particularly in a sector that thrives on being outside the mainstream. And yet for tourists here, the arts funding doesn't seem to be a problem. Cranes and scaffolding are up at the city's parliament building and on the cathedral. And bold plans have been approved to create a museum's quarter by merging the National Gallery with the Museum of Fine Arts. That'll create a new high culture hub in the heart of Budapest and is expected to be completed by 2018. Keith Wallace with the Angry Artists of Budapest. And your thoughts on that, of course, would be more than welcome. Our email address, as usual, fasttrack at bbc.com. And we're also on social media. Do look out for us on Facebook, Twitter and Pinterest. Right, let's have a look at what else has been making headlines in the world of travel over the past seven days. Starting in East Africa and their shock on the paradise island of Zanzibar after acid was thrown into the faces of two British women. Police say it's the first time foreigners there have been attacked in that way. The two 18-year-olds were flown to mainland Tanzania for treatment. 
An investigation is underway after fire gutted the arrivals hall at the main international airport at the Kenyan capital Nairobi. Jomo Kenyatta is now open again, though it's still worth checking any knock-on effects if you're due to fly there in the near future. No serious injuries were reported. Correspondents say the airport is old and overcrowded. It has really been a quick, quick kind of uh, decision made to order to let planes come in because we're stuck in Uganda and our plane was delayed a little bit, but we're able to come. Climbers planning to go up Mount Everest will be closely monitored in the future by the Nepalese government. The move follows embarrassing incidents on the slopes of the world's tallest peak, including a fight between Sherpas and mountaineers. The permanent government team will be employed at base camp by early next year to help expedition teams coordinate rescues and protect the environment. And finally, don't touch the exhibits. The cardinal rule of museum going, ignored by one American tourist who managed to snap a finger off this 14th century statue at Florence's Museum dell'Opera del Duomo. The finger wasn't an original, but the man in question might receive a huge fine. That's it for now, but do stay with us because coming up, Japan, Brazil and Oman all feature on Michelle's to-do list over the coming weeks. And we find out how a military standoff is providing inspiration for Chinese tourists with a hankering for hardware. Hello, I'm Michelle Yanachan, and this is Fast Track's Insider Guide with my top travel tips from around the world. Until August 26th, the world's largest arts festival, the Edinburgh Fringe, takes place in the Scottish capital. There'll be thousands of performances at hundreds of venues. Anybody can perform, from students to superstars. Now through October is an ideal time to spot wildlife in Brazil's Pantanal region in the west of the country. Animals and birds here are similar to those found in the Amazon basin, but are much easier to spot amongst this swampy grassland than in dense jungle. Look out for the beady eyes of caiman and capybara, the world's largest rodent. 
in Japan, the Aichi Triennale runs until October 27th, reflecting on the arts in the wake of the 2011 East Japan earthquake. It showcases contemporary art and stage performances in traditional venues as well as on the city streets of Nagoya and Okazaki. In Belgium, offering some new living history experiences, the Memorial Museum Passchendaele 1917's opened a new wing. There's a gallery of remembrance and visitor centre, as well as six World War I trenches. The museum also focuses on the Battle of Ypres. Also in Belgium, the Red Star Line Museum is opening in Antwerp late September. Set in the historic warehouses of the Red Star Line Shipping Company, the museum will explore the stories of the millions of European passengers who emigrated to North America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A round of the Enduro World Series, a discipline of mountain biking, will be held in Val d'Isère at the end of August. The Alpine Town will host part of the French Enduro Cup and international mountain biking competitions over the August 24th, 25th weekend. Enduro bikers face demanding hill climbs as well as steep mountain descents. In Kenya, the Rift Valley Festival this year plays August 30th through September 2nd at Fisherman's Camp on the shores of Lake Nyabasha. Set under acacia trees, the festival celebrates East African culture and music while raising money for local community projects. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they'll not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. In the USA on August 28th, the country will celebrate 50 years since Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Thousands of civil rights supporters listened to King's speech of 1963 as he pushed for change for African Americans. And this year, crowds are also expected at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. There'll be marches around the Capitol and the King Center in Atlanta is coordinating bell ringing events around the world to mark the date. And on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef, the Audi Hamilton Island Race Week celebrates 30 years this year, an offshore yachting regatta among Queensland's Whitsunday Islands in Australia. Running from August 17th to the 24th, it's also a wonderful time for whale watching there. The Whitsundays is an important carving ground for humpback whales. Thanks for checking in with my Insider Guide this month. Until next time, happy travelling. Michelle Yanachan with some suggestions perhaps for your next trip. Now finally today, we're off to the tiny Matsu Islands, which for decades have been the front line in the military standoff between Taiwan and China. But these days, relations between the two are much better. And so Matsu is hoping to use its defensive history to attract visitors from the Chinese mainland. Cindy Su has been there to see what these former enemies might expect. Maju in the 1950s, soldiers battled to protect the island chain and the rest of Taiwan from a communist invasion. Now, Maju is hoping to turn its wartime past into tourist attractions. The economy once depended on the 50,000 soldiers stationed here, but now only about 5,000 troops remain, partly because of improved relations with China. Many of the residents have had to move to mainland Taiwan for jobs. The islands see only about a few thousand tourists a year. They want a lot more, especially those from China, which is only a stone's throw away. We hope Matsu can be built into a resort on the sea that will attract tourists from China and elsewhere. This will stimulate Matsu's overall tourism development. With its mere 29 square kilometers of land, it has the world's highest density of air raid shelters, an estimated 250 of them, including bomb shelters, forts and tunnels. 
The precise locations of some of them still can't be disclosed because, after all, the possibility of war between mainland China and Taiwan still exists. The two sides have yet to sign a peace treaty. Many of the military facilities have been open to tourists in recent years. One of them is the Beihai Tunnel, the longest tunnel in Maju. Built in 1968, it was meant to shelter small military vessels from bombardment and bad weather. Unfortunately, the engineers miscalculated the range of tides and it became unusable. But now it's one of the most popular attractions in Maju. Tens of thousands of soldiers helped build this tunnel, not only with dynamite, but picks and shovels. And hundreds of them died doing so, from dynamite blasts and falling rocks. I think those times are really frightening. So many people were sacrificed. I feel we were very fortunate. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't have the happy life we have in Taiwan today. Some of the military attractions, like this cannon firing base, can be put into operation at any time. It holds a big cannon that can hit mainland China if fired. It was given to Taiwan by the Americans and used during the Korean War. Visitors can even try their hand at pulling the cannon trigger. <laughs> For those who don't like the fun and games approach to military tourism, Maju is still an excellent place for Cold War history buffs. Opened in 2010, this War and Peace Museum helps visitors understand the tensions between mainland China and Taiwan at the time. It's quite moving to see that our two sides have ended the hostile situation and our two people's lives are prosperous and happy today. We hope there won't be any war in the future. Most Maju residents, such as bed and breakfast owner Mr. Cao Erlan, welcome Chinese tourists, even though some people are worried that Maju's economy will become too dependent on China. Mr. Cao remembers the war clearly. Everyone was very nervous at the time. We didn't know when the artillery shells would hit and where they would hit, so everyone had an unsettled feeling. The soldiers from mainland Taiwan would cry when they found out they would be stationed in Matsu. They weren't the only ones who cried. We Matsu residents also cried. One day we might be having dinner together as a family, but we didn't know whether we could have dinner together the next day. But perhaps the best example of how Maju is able to move beyond the pass is Tunnel 88. The 264-meter-long former air raid shelter has been given a new persona as a wine cellar. There's a sweet aroma. It smells like wine grapes, but it's actually glutinous rice wine. These spirits, known as Maju Laojiu, have become one of the most popular souvenirs for tourists. If Maju's plan to become a tourist hotspot succeeds, this distillery could soon sell a lot more of the spirits. The government, meanwhile, hopes to turn more military facilities into tourist attractions. Cindy Sue on the islands ready for an invasion, hopefully of tourists. And that's it for this week. Any thoughts on anything you've heard? Do email us at the address shown below or through our website or contact us through social media. We're all over Twitter, Facebook and Pinterest. Next week, we're up in the skies above Canada. This summer, Canada's biggest airlines are finding new battlegrounds. They're facing off in the smaller communities across the country. And while that's lowering fares, it's also causing concerns over the regional airlines those smaller communities have come to rely on and even invest in. We don't have enough competition. Our distances are great, but we also cannot get, I've never been to the east coast of Canada, but I've flown to South America to, uh, you know, all over Asia, all over Europe, and flights are equivalent to flying across the country here. When I just went to New Orleans in uh, January, I saved about $900 driving to Seattle instead of flying out of YVR Airport in Vancouver. There's just not enough competition in Canada, and so we really get gouged for our airfares. There's no, there's no way, uh, other way to put it. We are being gouged. 
So as the skies above Canada get more crowded, who are the real winners of the aerial turf war? Join me next week to find out. In the meantime, from the whole Fast Track team here at Regent's Park in London, thanks for watching and goodbye.